Welcome to the Explorers. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. <laughs> you follow the flash of your friends' sparkly dresses, feeling your heart pick up its pace. You're heading toward a familiar green door, nestled underneath the stoop of an old brownstone. Three brutal-looking men sit in front on wooden stools, playing a game of cards. You flash them your membership card, and they give you a good looking over. Then one of them takes the gun out of his waistband and wraps the butt against the door in a quick pattern. There's the sound of scraping metal, and a blue eye appears in the peephole, glaring. Then, at last, the door swings open, and you sashay into your favorite illegal club. Once inside, you make a beeline to the crowded bar, dodging tipsy couples doing the Charleston and ignoring the mobsters making deals in the shadows. In the haze of cigarette smoke, your friends find a table close to the stage, where the jazz band is sweating underneath the spotlights. You order a round of Mary Pickford's, a bright red cocktail made with white rum, pineapple juice, grenadine, and maraschino liqueur, served chilled with a cherry. Alcohol may be illegal, and the police may break down the door any minute, but it can be pretty fun living dangerously. After all, what good is a girl's night out without a drink or three? Federal law prohibited the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol in America from January 17, 1920 to December 5, 1933. That's more than a decade of a national booze ban. But prohibition didn't magically transform all Americans into teetotalers, as some had hoped. Alcohol consumption was simply driven underground, and drinking became the nation's new favorite clandestine pastime, and its worst-kept secret. Most people assumed that women, at least, would abide by the law, given their active role in the temperance movement. They couldn't have been more wrong. In the 1920s, women were not only drinking at cabarets, but operating speakeasies, smuggling bootlegged liquor, and even brewing homemade moonshine. Let's time travel back to the 1920s once more and meet some of the women who regularly defied prohibition for fun and money, thrill, and the pursuit of independence. Stuff your flask into your stocking, practice that alibi, and get ready to learn some fun 1920s slang. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My newest boss ladies, Tadea and Emma. My warrior queens, Sophia, Alexis, Amanda, Kate, Ika, June, Neve, and Sloan, and Samantha. My imperial empresses, Bridget, Katie, Faye and Whimsy Soapworks, Samara, and Teresa. And my lady pharaohs, Cheryl, Sophie, Kat, Kate, Laura. Lewis, and the fabulous Courtney's. Patrons play a huge role in keeping this show going. For just a couple of bucks a month, they support an independent creator and get access to exclusive bonus episodes, contests, the Explores yearly calendar, full interviews with guests, merch, and more. To find out all about it, just go to my website. And don't forget, Nightbirds, my 1920s-tinted feminist fantasy novel, is now out in the world. If you're enjoying this season, I think you'll love it. You can find it wherever good books and audiobooks are sold. As we learned in part one of our Prohibition time travels, which you should definitely go back and listen to if you haven't already, Prohibition officially goes into effect on January 17th, 1920. But enforcing it is another issue entirely. Generations before had tried to make America dry, and it didn't go well. This isn't America's first rodeo with an alcohol ban. 
1844, when the state of Massachusetts passed a law banning the sale of booze, an enterprising tavern owner started charging patrons to come and see a striped pig at his establishment. The drinks were incidental, being free with the price of admission. In 1851, when Maine tried something similar, the working-class and Irish immigrant population in Portland led a riot that helped lead to the law's repeal. Still, the Drys go into this new era armed with optimism. Prohibition is going to root out the evil of drinking in America. Definitely. There's only one problem. Making booze illegal has made it kind of sexy. Those who choose to imbibe even have a cool-sounding name. In 1924, the Boston Herald asks its readers to coin a term for someone who defies prohibition and drinks liquor. Two readers split the prize for coming up with the word scofflaw. A lot of people are fascinated by the rising glamour of 1920s drinking culture, and no one seems more charmed by the thrills it can offer than some of America's women. Turns out the ladies are drinking more, not less, during Prohibition. But why? Before the law passed, drinking was considered a very gendered activity, particularly drinking in public. Saloons were the place many people did their social drinking, and most of them didn't welcome women. If a lady wanted to drink, she was expected to do it at home, or in one of the ladies' drinking rooms, out of sight of the men next door. But Prohibition changes the game when it forces male-dominated saloons to shut down. In the early days of Prohibition, the easiest and cheapest place to get a drink is at a private party at someone's house. Hence the soaring popularity of cocktail parties. Wealthy men and women host intimate gatherings and serve liquor they've been saving, or hoarding, in the year before the law came into effect. They serve it alongside finger foods such as lobster canapes, caviar rolls, oyster toast, and jellied anchovy mold. Ooh. A good cocktail party is always beloved by a cellar smeller. A young man who always turns up where liquor is to be had without cost. You know who you are, okay? But as bars and saloons are forced to close, more discreet establishments rise up to replace them. Gin joints, blind pigs, speakeasies. They're all names for illicit bars where you can hang out for a drink and perhaps get some entertainment. While blind tigers are legitimate storefronts, usually pharmacies, bodegas, or soft drink parlors, that also sell booze under the counter. Nightclubs and cabarets tend to serve alcohol, but they are still technically legal because they primarily operate as entertainment venues for singers and dancers. Where does the name speakeasy come from? We think the term comes from the 19th century speak softly shops in Great Britain. Customers in these illegal drinking establishments were advised to speak quietly to avoid the wrath of the law. Others believe it came from patrons having to whisper or speak easy to gain entrance to a hidden bar without fear of being overheard by Bureau of Prohibition agents. Regardless of its etymology, the term speakeasy entered common usage during Prohibition, and they are all about secrecy. Many employ membership cards, passwords, peepholes, and hidden entrances to keep their existence on the down-low. Some owners will only admit a patron if they know them personally or can provide a reference. So what, I need a letter of recommendation to get zazzled now? Given all the cloak and dagger, how hard will we need to look to find a speakeasy in the 1920s? Not very, turns out, especially in bigger cities. New Orleans is widely considered the wettest city in America, but New York City could give it a serious run for its money. In the late 20s, it is home to more than 32,000 speakeasies. Part of the reason the Bureau has such a difficult time shutting down such places is that they might pop up anywhere. A 1921 Variety article noted that They nest in empty lofts, former dancing studios, the lower floors of old English basements and high stoop houses, in flats and wherever one can imagine. <laughs> Every speakeasy looks a little different once you step inside. 
At this sketchy end of the spectrum is your dingy, hole-in-the-wall place that serves questionable alcohol. These are bare-bones makeshift joints in a back room or in someone's basement. But they're still charging two to ten times more than saloons ever did. And the liquor is almost undrinkable. More on that later. On the opposite end, you've got your super swanky clubs. The high-end places where movie stars and Rockefellers and mobsters get chummy over martinis. Most speakeasies fall somewhere between these, but the high-end establishments really set the bar in the public's imagination. So, speakeasies become places where lavish displays of wealth and extravagant consumption are encouraged. If you want to go somewhere really fancy, a nightclub or a cabaret is your best bet. Since they are technically legal, they live longer than speakeasies, and owners can invest more in decor. Many clubs have themes. They're ones decorated like an ocean liner, a pirate's den, a southern plantation, and a Parisian cafe. The aquarium has a giant fish tank, and the circus has, well, an actual circus. All of them want to bring our fabulous flappers flocking in. Unlike the saloon, the speakeasy has no problem whatsoever with women having a tipple. In fact, they are very keen for us to swing by. These are places that allow us to move through anonymously, free from the outside world that demands conformity to societal conventions. After all, if laws are being broken in the speakeasy, why shouldn't gender norms be poked at as well? Men and women can mix freely in these places, as do different races. Some speakeasies are segregated, but many aren't. At a time in which lynching is still a dangerous presence, and the KKK is experiencing a disturbing resurgence, these bars are often the only place in which black and white patrons can socialize without fear. In fact, one newspaper argued that, Nightclubs have done more to improve race relations in 10 years than the churches have done in 10 decades. The speakeasy becomes a place where unlikely crowds can mingle. Black and white, men and women, rich and poor can all party together, united by their desire to drink. Police precinct captains drink with famous authors, mobsters chat with movie stars, robber barons hang with jazz musicians. One 1927 article claims of New York's nightclubs, Never before has there been such a meeting ground of the very highest and very lowest of human society. We ladies are soaking it in, fueled by alcohol and good music. And the thing is, we quite enjoy it. As one Daily Boston Globe article notes, it has become socially quite acceptable for the females to inhabit the speakeasy. And they do, in droves, as in hordes, in chattering, gossipy dozens. They bring their dancing partners, their poker parties, their friendships. Nights when there is nothing better to do, they bring their husbands. Many are those fun-loving gals we call flappers, who we learned all about a few episodes back. They are the scandalous gals flashing their knees and dancing on tables. Film star Colleen Moore described seeing several flappers at a speakeasy, saying, They were smart and sophisticated, with an air of independence about them, and so casual about their looks and clothes and manners as to be almost slapdash. I don't know if I realized as soon as I began seeing them that they represented the wave of the future. But there are plenty of other women drinking there as well. Public drinking has become so popular that both socially decent and indecent ladies are all imbibing at their nearest speakeasy. It's liberating being able to go to a place where parental and legal authority is almost non-existent. They can mix with interesting people, free of judgment. By going to a previously male-dominated space and engaging in a previously male-dominated activity, women are asserting their social and political independence. Having a drink at the bar isn't just a fun thing to do, it's a political statement. Women are demanding the same rights as men, including the right to drink in public. We are here, and we are thirsty, gentlemen. Get used to it. Speakeasy owners go out of their way to charm and entice their female customers. Most ladies aren't comfortable standing at the bar or perching on a bar stool to order a drink, so many clubs introduce table service. Some install powder rooms, introduce finger food menus, change up their decor to appeal to what they believe is a more feminine design sense. Some even make a point of hiring attractive male bartenders and waiters. 
I'll raise a glass to that. So, when we sidle up to one of these fabulous bars, what exactly are we going to be drinking? Before Prohibition, it would have probably been beer, cider, or wine. Unfortunately, these beverages are pretty scarce after the 18th Amendment is enacted, and most of the available liquor is strong, foul-tasting, bootlegged gin. This nose-hair-singeing industrial swill is not particularly appealing to the ladies, many of whom are pretty new to drinking. Even old hats like our society writer and bona fide flapper babe, Lois Long, is hesitant to drink it. As Lois will remember later, We thought brandy was the only safe thing to drink, because we were told a bootlegger couldn't fake the smell and taste of cognac. Rum, too, is considered fairly safe, as it's being smuggled in large quantities from the Caribbean. But since the most widely available liquor is that foul-tasting gin, we're gonna have to learn to live with it. So bartenders begin inventing complex cocktails to dilute and hide the burn. Cocktails did exist before Prohibition. In fact, lots of women were crafting them at home. Popular household cooking and etiquette books of the 19th and early 20th century have whole sections on making mixed drinks for dinner parties. But the ones being made in the saloon tended to be simple, with just two or three ingredients, with few standard recipes, and most just stuck to straight hard liquor or beer. But during Prohibition, the cocktail becomes hugely popular, partially because speakeasies are keen to entice their growing female clientele. Cocktails like the Bee's Knees, the Gin Ricky, the French 75, the Sidecar, one of my favorites, and the Mary Pickford are all the rage, as is a cocktail called the Last Word, which combines gin, green chartreuse, lime juice, and maraschino liqueur. I know, it sounds like a lot, but I promise it's delicious. One might also enjoy the Lipstick, Lois Long's signature cocktail, which mixes champagne, gin, orange juice, grapefruit juice, and cherry brandy. Cocktails are by and large the preferred drink of female patrons because they're sweeter and more aesthetically pleasing. Speakeasy bartenders take note, crafting colorful drinks especially tailored for women. Men are usually given most of the credit for our famous Prohibition-era cocktails, but women play a giant role in making them so popular. Of course, women aren't just visiting the speakeasy. They're also working in, and sometimes running them. Many work as entertainers in nightclubs and cabarets, though they aren't technically breaking the law in doing so. Other ladies work in speakeasies as hostesses, and are mainly paid to fleece unsuspecting customers using their feminine wiles. They are tasked with flirting with men, enticing them to keep buying expensive drinks and get as drunk as possible. This is not an easy or even safe occupation. As one hostess remarked, It's tough to sit cold sober and have a lot of tipsy guys trying to paw you over. You'd be surprised at the things men ask us before they've even been in the place five minutes almost before the first drink is on the table. Maybe we feel like slapping their dirty mouths or telling them in plain language where they get off. But we don't dare. We have to stall them along for fear they will leave the place before they've even spent any money. And believe me, we are out for money. We work hard for what we get. $20 a week is the usual salary of a nightclub hostess. And to make any kind of a living, we have to plug for tips. Two well-known hostesses are even more ambitious. They manage their own clubs, which become wildly popular thanks to the boss ladies who run them. Mary Louise Cecilia Texas Guinan starts her career as a pioneering Western movie star. She stars as a gunslinging cowgirl in three dozen silent films before moving to New York in the early 20s. She is introduced to Larry Fay, a big shot rum runner, and becomes the hostess at his famed speakeasy, the El Fay Club. The El Fay plays host to celebrities like Babe Ruth, Charlie Chaplin, Clara Bow, Gloria Swanson, and Charles Lindbergh. Texas is known for greeting them all with her signature line, Hello, suckers. 
She is charismatic and hilarious, known for her legendary hospitality and for making people feel at home. She's also full of charmingly winning one-liners, like a fight, a night, or your money back. And you may be all the world to your mother, but you're just a cover charge to me. Texas is also street smart and quick on her feet. When the feds raid the Elfe on the night the Prince of Wales happens to be there, she stashes him in the kitchen, puts him in an apron, and tells him to start cooking some eggs. She then tells the police that he's a fry cook to help him dodge a scandal. When the Elfe eventually closes, Texas hops from club to club, becoming an icon of the speakeasy circuit. As one newspaper writes, Jimmy Walker rules New York by day, Texas Guinan by night. Yes, she does. The Bureau frequently raids her not-so-secret clubs, but Texas takes it all in stride, blowing agents' kisses and serenading them with body songs. She appears in court 11 times, but she is never convicted. After all, she never personally sells liquor. She doesn't even technically own her clubs. She's just a hostess. If sexist laws and attitudes have to be a thing, you might as well work them to your favor. Our second lady speakeasy boss is Belle Livingston, otherwise known as Queen of the Nightclub, a showgirl who gains national fame for her perfect Gibson girl measurements. She makes a career performing on Broadway, then moves to London and Paris, where a journalist writes her curves make her the most dangerous woman in Europe. He isn't wrong. She marries three times, but seems to prefer the single life. In her autobiography, she writes... Two things happened that made me see that the world, the flesh, and the devil were going to be more powerful influences in my life, after all, than the chapel bell. First, I tasted champagne. Second, the theater. In 1927, in her early 50s, Belle moves back to New York City, befriends Texas Guinan, and opens an elite speakeasy with a $200 annual membership. That's about $3,000 today. Unsurprisingly, it folds due to financial trouble, but she soon opens a second speakeasy, then a third, calling it the 58th Street Country Club. Members of this club are pre-screened by Belle, and they have to be either rich or famous, but, you know, preferably both. The club's opening night is attended by the creme de la creme of high society, including John D. Rockefeller and the Duke of Manchester who sets about enjoying the five-story club's Italian marble floors, ping-pong tables, mini golf course, oriental-themed room, vaulted Florentine ceilings, and even a brook stocked with goldfish. Unfortunately, Belle's notoriety is a double-edged sword, and the feds end up raiding her club. She attempts to escape arrest whilst wearing red silk pajamas, but she is soon caught and sentenced to 30 days in jail. I hope they let her keep that fancy jammy set. Of course, not everyone loves seeing women infiltrate their local watering hole. A male reporter for the Daily Boston Globe bemoans many of the changes, writing, The speakeasy, preparing for lady customers, is changing its entire outer aspect. The hardest barkeep sheds tears as he leads you through your once favorite dump now so gilded and far bellowed as to be hardly recognizable. It is not his fault, he hastens to explain, very, very bitter. The boss is no true artist. He is catering to the women. Well, yes, sir, he certainly is. And these bars are the better for it. Women expect much more out of their drinking experience than men, and speakeasies deliver. The culture around drinking transforms to include things like dancing to jazz, which creates the energetic, glamorous escapism that helps define the Roaring Twenties. You'd think these men would be grateful to all of these new female drinkers. After all, they've rescued them from their boring Friday night sausage fests. But many do not like women crashing what was previously a boys-only club, and some lament the loss of their sacred, private spaces. As one whines, no longer can honest and toil-weary males have their great escape from the female noise, interference, and falals. No more can they drink their honest booze and respectable privacy. Another particularly disgruntled drama king, Don Marquis, moans that Women come into this new barroom, they go right up to the bar. They put a foot on the brass railing, they order, 
they're served. They bend the elbow, they hoist, they toss down the feminine esophagus, the brew that was really meant for men. Stout and wicked men. The last barrier is down. The citadel has been stormed and taken. There's no longer any escape. No hiding place where the hounded male may seek his fellow and strut his stuff, safe from the atmosphere and presence of femininity. A man might as well do his drinking at home, with his wife and daughters. And there was never fun in that. Cry me a river, Donny boy. Many are disturbed simply to see women out and partying unchaperoned. One astonished bartender remarked, In the old days, you seldom saw a respectable lady enter a bar room unescorted. Look at them now. They not only come in alone, but order hard liquor. Others are appalled at seeing women half cut or happily intoxicated and stumbling out of speakeasies with their mascara running. Prohibition sees a dramatic increase in women arrested for public drunkenness, which is a problem, another speakeasy employee complains, because Women are more apt to be unmanageable when they are drunk. They make too much noise and want to do solo dances or sing songs. Oh my, a solo dance? I do hope it's being done on a table. Some gentlemen attempt to take the situation in hand more forcefully. After dozens of women are caught carrying whiskey flasks into nightclubs, Judge Dan Shea of Montana proposes a city ordinance calling for police to be stationed in all the city's dance halls. Spoiler alert, it doesn't go well. Some morality watchdogs are concerned about the sexually loose atmosphere that alcohol and speakeasies seem to cultivate. Women aren't being courted anymore. They're going on dates, mixing freely and casually with men in these spaces. Women three cocktails deep aren't as worried about guarding their reputations or their virginity as some people think they ought to be, and some find that deeply disturbing. In 1927, Mrs. J. Borden Harriman complains about this loss of morality in the Washington Post, describing, Girls of the working classes going to questionable dance halls, and those of the more prosperous classes spending the hours of mourning in nightclubs, unchaperoned parties, a promiscuous mingling of the sexes, loose flirtations, crude demonstrations of affection publicly, in nightclubs, at parties, in automobiles, and in public parks. They have little reserve and no feeling of shame. Others see the openly sexual behavior occurring in speakeasies as so blasphemous that they blame clubs for causing a non-existent surge in prostitution. We'll talk more about 1920s dating and romance in a future episode. But for now, let's just say that the speakeasy is a space of female emancipation and independence, but it can be a dangerous place as well. It's important to keep in mind that most Americans in the 1920s aren't bending elbows at swanky speakeasies. Alcohol prices are consistently marked way up due to the unbalanced supply and demand, and to account for the risk involved in selling it. For example, a lager cost 10 cents in 1916 and 80 cents in 1928. That's a 600% price increase. Gaining entrance to a speakeasy is often expensive, too, with their entertainment, fancy decor, and need to pay off the police, and source bootlegged alcohol that won't kill its customers. Annual membership fees at nightclubs range from $10 to $100, at a time when the average, white, male American earned around $100 a month. Drinking at night speakeasies is generally the pastime of the wealthy. For the richest people in America, prohibition doesn't even really exist. Keeping that in mind, are we lady scofflaws worried about a run-in with the law? Not overly. Thousands of speakeasies are raided by the Bureau of Prohibition, but they're a nuisance for proprietors more than anything else. If your speakeasy is raided, you're arrested, given a court date, and then fined and possibly sentenced to some jail time, depending on whether you're a repeat offender. But we're talking about speakeasy owners here, not its patrons. Most drinkers find raids more of a nuisance than something to be afraid of. Take it from our gal pal Lois Long, who had this to say about a few of the raids she experienced. About the spectacular dry raids of last week, there's nothing to be said except that a number of 
naughty cabaret owners just won't be allowed to sell liquor anymore. And by the time you read this, 50 or more clubs will be on the verge of closing, and 57 others will be on the verge of opening. All in all, it was a hollow victory for the cause of enforcement, even if it was likely to drive up cover charges at the city's many notorious watering holes. The worst part about a raid for club owners is that the temporary closure of your speakeasy leads to a loss of income, and the thousands of dollars of alcohol you purchased is confiscated to be used as evidence at your trial. Then it's poured right down the drain. Nothing makes a gangster want to weep quite so loudly as seeing good booze go to waste. To avoid this sad fate, some speakeasy owners hide or move their liquor stashes. They often purchase a building or apartment right next to their speakeasy to store their liquor in, as these places are rarely included in search warrants. Secret compartments and intricate chute systems are also common. At the push of a button, a liquor cabinet might drop to the basement, the alcohol emptied into the sewer, leaving nothing behind but a pile of suspicious broken glass. The 21 Club in Manhattan has especially stringent security measures. It features hidden compartments that can withstand dynamite in the upper floor closets, and a secret wine cellar in the basement hidden behind a false brick wall complete with a hidden door, a fancy-looking lock system, and no visible keyhole. The 21 Club does not mess around. It's the poorest people in America, who are overwhelmingly immigrants and African Americans, who are way more likely to be arrested than the wealthy businessmen and mobsters managing massive nightclubs and glamorous speakeasies. Your average women in America can't even afford to get into one. In many ways, prohibition exacerbates existing geographic, class, and racial divides in America. If you are a woman in a big city, for example, it's much easier to find a drink than if you live in a more rural area. In a place like New Orleans, you might grab a drink at the corner grocery store, a blind tiger, a cabaret or nightclub, or at a speakeasy, all of which have a variety of drinks to choose from. If you live in Kentucky, you might try your luck at the soft drink parlor or at a roadhouse, a place that serves as a boarding house, sometimes brothel, bar, and dance hall. These places might have beer or gin on offer, but your best bet is simply brewing your own moonshine at home. Most speakeasies are just too expensive for working-class women. Black women have the added indignity of segregation, with some clubs that won't even let them in, despite how many of them employ black men and women as bartenders, waiters, chefs, busboys, hostesses, dancers, musicians, and singers. Black musicians are making jazz an era-defining staple in speakeasies and cabarets, and many open in predominantly black neighborhoods, like New York City's Harlem or Chicago's South Side. White Americans start to flood these spaces, and certain businessmen start to capitalize on the fad. In Harlem especially, they craft voyeuristic, racist visions of the antebellum South for their white-only clientele. The Plantation Club, for example, is decorated with slave cabins and real-life mammies, while the Cotton Club, owned by mobster Oni Madden, features black dancers like Josephine Baker and musicians like Duke Ellington, but bars black patrons. Not a great look, 1920s America. If you are a black woman, or working class, or just don't have a lot of money on hand, home speaks are the cheapest and easiest place to grab a drink. Men and women sell home-brewed liquor out of their kitchens and invite their friends to come over for drinking and dancing. The type of alcohol usually served at these home speaks is not all that great. It's often called hooch, a catch-all term for poor-quality liquor. You can find it at hooch joints in working-class neighborhoods being guzzled by hooch hounds or a hip hound, aka those who drink hooch. There are also rent parties, which are often hosted in the apartments of folks struggling to pay their rent. They invite family and friends over and charge less than a dollar at the door for admission and liquor, then use the money to pay their landlords. People bring food, and musicians are encouraged to bring their instruments. The kind of liquor available at rent parties is usually either homemade corn liquor, dubbed King Kong, or bootleg gin, and drinks are sold by the pint or quarter pint, called shorties. These rent parties are common in black neighborhoods and allow people to pitch in and help their neighbors to drink and socialize without paying too much. 
So no matter who you are, if you want to drink in the 20s, you don't have to try that hard to get the thing done. But this era isn't all tipsy dancing, secret passwords, and great jazz. Drinking comes with dangers. One of the unintended side effects of prohibition is the market it creates for dangerous kinds of booze. Industrial alcohol, like the kind found in cleaning supplies, is exempt from the 18th Amendment, and it contains toxic chemicals that make it dangerous to drink. Most forms of industrial booze are mixed with wood alcohol, which attacks the nervous system and can cause blindness or even death. The government assumed that because it was broadly known to be poisonous, Americans would be smart enough not to drink it. Right? Enterprising bootleggers steal about 10 million gallons of industrial alcohol in the 1920s and sell it to speakeasies at marked-up prices. Some bootleggers know full well that it contains wood alcohol and attempt to remove the toxins by boiling it. Helpful hint, that is not gonna work. Other bootleggers don't even bother doing that, selling the stuff to unsuspecting drinkers who can't afford high-quality liquor. This leads to thousands of accidental poisonings and up to 50,000 deaths across America. In 1926, 307 people die in Philadelphia in just one month from wood alcohol-laced liquor, and about 15,000 are poisoned in one county in Kansas. Of the 480,000 gallons of alcohol confiscated by the Bureau in New York in 1927, 98% of it contains toxic additives. To recreate the flavor of bourbon, they leave dead rats or rotten meat to sit in moonshine and soak in all of that dead goodness. Yikes! Some bootleggers are making quality liquor, but they cut it with other things to make it stretch further, and thus reap in more dollars. They might do this with water, or it might be things like mouthwash, perfume, hair tonic, antifreeze, or embalming liquid. Which is why some people start calling bootleggers the Embalmer. Not a nickname I personally would want to sew to my lapel. So, there are plenty of risks when it comes to drinking during Prohibition, but even more so for the people openly defying the law. But with risks come some significant rewards. Making booze illegal creates a black market for it, practically overnight, and some women are keen to get in on the action. There's quite a lot of money to be made from bootlegging or the illegal manufacture, sale, or distribution of alcohol. Many of the ones making it are men, like Al Capone, famous gangster. He is pulling in $60 million a year supplying speakeasies, which is more than $900 million today. That's a lot of money, and women want their piece of the pie. <laughs> Let's start with some of the women making liquid contraband, because there are a lot of them. Lady bootleggers, who are often called a snake charmer, are way more plentiful than men. Why? Well, first off, because the ingredients for moonshine are pretty easy to come by. In bigger towns and cities, grocery and hardware stores sell most of the perfectly legal ingredients needed to make, say, wine from grape concentrate or beer from yeast and malt syrup. Women living in rural areas are making bootleg liquor too, largely moonshine, using the crops grown on their farms. The term moonshine originated long before prohibition, a nod to the process of making illegally distilled alcohol solely by the light of the moon. They use illegal stills to ferment a mash made of corn, fruit, or even potatoes and beets, and then distill it to create high-proof spirits. Then they mix it with glycerin, juniper oil, and water, and voila! Gin? I mean, if you say so. Moonshine operations are so common that, in the 1920s, the Bureau seizes nearly 250,000 illegal stills a year. This doesn't stop New Jersey gal Nancy the Moonshiner, who becomes rather well known for her hard cider. She goes out at night and steals apples from a neighboring orchard to make it. Maggie Bailey is a Kentucky moonshiner dubbed the Queen of the Mountain Bootleggers, though she never drinks the stuff herself. 
She starts selling moonshine at age 17 to support her family. And although she'll be arrested 37 times, she's only convicted once. Largely because of her encyclopedic knowledge of search and seizure laws. Girl knows what's up. The second reason so many women are making booze themselves is because it's a lucrative side hustle. Women are running mostly small-scale operations, brewing alcohol in the comfort of their home, and selling it to neighbors to supplement their husband's income. It's perfect for housewives, mothers, and widows because alcohol can easily be made in the kitchen, which is where some women are expected to be anyway. The history of alcohol is full of women, mostly brewing and distilling at home. It allows mothers to bring in a hefty income while still being able to watch their children. Anna Butler, who sells homemade liquor to her boarding house patrons, makes $150 a day, at a time when the average working woman is making less than $23 a week. For many women, the potential economic gain outweighs any concerns about the law. Anyway, the mostly male judges and agents of the time seem unable to believe that women are capable of engaging in criminal activity. You keep on thinking that, boys. But as we know, some moonshiners are making their own stuff because they can't trust anyone else's. The unpredictability of bootlegged liquor and the rot gut it caused is largely why people start seeking out specific brand names. Before the 1920s, you would simply go into your bar and ask for a gin. During Prohibition, a gin might kill you, so you were better off asking for, say, Gilby's, a quality English gin often smuggled into New York from across the pond. Thus, rum running, or the organized smuggling of liquor by land and sea, can be seriously lucrative. Though often, it's only America's gangsters who have the organization, logistical expertise, and manpower to create bootlegging operations around the nation's borders. Shipments from Canada can be smuggled in by automobile, hidden under false floorboards or in fake gas tanks. Shipments coming in from Europe through the Bahamas and the Caribbean are even harder to police. Captains load bottles into false-bottom boats, then wait at designated points near the coast for small, high-speed boats to make the handoff. The stretch of ocean 12 miles into international waters between New York and Atlantic City is such a rum-running hotspot that it's referred to as Rum Row. By 1930, the government will estimate that smuggling foreign-made liquor into the country is a $3 billion industry. That's around $51 billion today. The Coast Guard becomes so frustrated with trying to bust the seemingly endless rum running that the government gives them 200 more cruisers, 90 more speedboats, and 36 World War I naval ships to tackle the problem. <laughs> At least one of these successful rum runners is a woman. Gertrude Lithgow is known by many fabulous names. There's Cleo, a nickname bestowed because she looks a bit like our favorite Egyptian pharaoh. And then there's the classic, Queen of the Bootleggers. Cleo once worked in New York as a clerk for a British liquor importer. But after 1920, she decides to put her knowledge of the industry to better use. She moves to Nassau in the Bahamas, commissions her own boats, and sets up a wholesale liquor export shop in the famously shady Lucerne Hotel. Although she doesn't go out on the high seas very often. After all, that's what minions are for. She does carry a gun and quickly earns a reputation as a ruthless, clever businesswoman who only smuggles the highest quality spirits. She stands alone and fearless, one smuggler said. A woman who would grace any London drawing room. She has commanded the respect and homage of this motley and dubious throng. She is mentored by none other than the most successful rum runner of the day, Bill McCoy, whose name is so synonymous with good alcohol that when someone tastes clean, smooth liquor, they'll say they found the real McCoy. Bill greatly admires Cleo's business acumen and daring, and describes her as... A tall, slender girl with black hair, a brain as steady as her own dark eyes, and a history that was nobody's business. And yet, Cleo loves giving interviews, and men send her ardent love letters after reading about her in the papers. She never marries, though, because, as she frequently tells the press, 
I don't need a man to tell me what to do. Yes, Queen. There are tons of enterprising women out there who seize the opportunity to make a little extra money selling alcohol. 22-year-old Lillian Johnson is a bootlegging gal who runs a soft drink stand in New Orleans, selling ice cream, soda, and, you know, some other stuff. When agents raid her stand, they find 159 bottles of cold beer concealed beneath the soda. How'd that get there? Josephine Duty is a snake charmer who lives in a remote cabin in Montana's Glacier National Park. When the Great Northern Railroad train passes by, it stops and toots the whistle especially for Josephine, who knows that the number of whistles correspond to the number of gallons of liquor the men want. Tiny little Josephine crosses the river in a small boat and delivers her bootlegged goods under the cover of darkness. 26-year-old Willie Carter Sharp of Virginia takes a much less subtle approach. She brazenly leads car chases and convoys of bootleggers across state lines, often with the police in red-hot pursuit. As she reminisced later, It was the excitement that got me. Cars scattering, dashing along the streets. She is arrested more than 13 times for driving offenses, hauls more than 220,000 gallons of bootleg liquor, and is known for her diamond-crusted dental work. Hey, a girl's gotta look good while she's breaking the law. But what happens if you're caught? That depends on who you are, really, and how many times you've been apprehended defying prohibition. Most of these women aren't career criminals, and the majority are between 30 and 50 years of age. Many are widowed, divorced, or separated from their husbands, and live in poor, working-class neighborhoods. They are almost always mothers, and many are first- or second-generation immigrants, often of Irish, German, Italian, or Slavic backgrounds. If the law catches up with you, your liquor stores and equipment is confiscated, and you have to appear before a judge. But these judges, who are mostly men, tend to view women as victims rather than criminals, and so they tend to receive much lighter punishments than men who break Volstead. Other judges just don't believe women can be the masterminds behind such crimes. After Catherine Mux is caught at a dance with a flask full of whiskey, the judge lets her go because that flask had a cockroach in it. I mean, she probably put it in there herself when she knew the jig was up. But the judge said that such a drink was not fit for human consumption and was therefore not intended for illegal recreational purposes. I mean, no lady would put such a thing to her delicate lips. The most common punishments for breaking prohibition include probation, fines, and sometimes jail time. But it's common for women's sentences to be suspended or commuted altogether, especially if they're a first-time offender. When Ann Foster and her husband are caught after selling beer to an undercover agent, they both plead guilty. Her husband is fined $200 and serves 90 days in jail. But Anne, on the other hand, is simply placed on a five-year probation. Similarly, when 80-year-old Lavinia Gilman is caught with an enormous 300-gallon still in her home, the court gives her a suspended sentence, provided she obeys the law for one year. Shortly after her court date, though, agents find yet another still at Lavinia's. Curl likes living dangerously. Other women aren't as fortunate as Anne and Lavinia. One, who had two previously suspended sentences for bootlegging, when caught a third time, is sentenced to 15 months at the U.S. Reformatory for Women and fined $500. When Bernice Oliver's at-home liquor and bottling plant is raided, and agents uncover about $1,000 worth of alcohol, she receives four months in a parish prison a 12-month suspended sentence, and a fine of $200. Many of the female bootleggers appearing in court defend themselves by saying they're only trying to provide for their children. When the judge asks 35-year-old Marie Hopp if she had a good reason for breaking the law, she responds, Yes, judge. I have six good reasons for making beer. I have six small children. Irma Lackman's husband was serving two years in jail for bootlegging, and so when she too was caught, she told the judge, I would rather be dead than violate the law. We have two young children, though, and I was forced to sell liquor or see them go hungry and without clothes. 
This is a time when women's chances of making a good and sustainable living is much harder than a man's. Irma only turns to bootlegging because she is unable to find another job, and her husband leaves her with $90 in cash and a $1,000 mortgage. Similarly, Mary Toya, a mother of six and a third-time offender, pleads with the judge not to sentence her husband. My husband had nothing to do with the liquor, she said. He works all right, but we didn't have enough money to care for the kids, so I just kept on selling it. I knew I would get caught again sooner or later. Mary is sentenced to a year in prison and fined $300, but because of her plea, the judge doesn't charge her husband. Even though female bootleggers vastly outnumber their male counterparts, they aren't caught nearly as often. This is partly because men just don't suspect them, and partly because it's considered scandalous to subject a woman to a bodily strip search. Women take advantage of agents' Victorian moral values, hiding liquor under their skirts and in their aprons. Some come up with ingenious places to hide their larger stashes. Esther Clark hides her moonshine in the chicken coop on her farm, because gathering eggs is considered women's work, and thus male agents won't even think to check there. As the era of prohibition drags on, some women continue to be content to break the law and subvert it but others are beginning to think about how to change it. It's women who helped usher in Prohibition, so why can't they organize once more to repeal it? In the late 1920s, the Women's Christian Temperance Union's influence begins to wane, as people have become fed up with the Volstead Act. It doesn't help that in 1925, 67-year-old Ella Bull takes the helm as president of the WCTU, and she is fiercely opposed to alcohol. But not just that. She also hates smoking, gambling, and attending movie theaters. Loosen up there, Ella. In other words, Ella is not a good look, as she seems old-fashioned and out of touch, and newspapers delight in contrasting her with the young, glamorous, and attractive queen of the speakeasies, Texas Guinan. But there is also the increasingly glaring fact that prohibition isn't really working. People are still drinking. With so much of drinking culture shoved under the table, lots of very toxic booze is being made. The law isn't being enforced properly, and it's caused an increase in violence and organized crime. And really, I think we're all just a little bit tired of this noble experiment, and there are ladies who aren't afraid to say so. In 1929, the Women's National Republican Club takes a sample poll of 1,500 women and finds that a whopping 1,393 of them want prohibition repealed. So, basically, that means all of them. By 1928, the movement to repeal prohibition is gaining momentum amongst America's women. The temperance and suffrage movements gave them political experience and know-how. And with the vote, they're optimistic about their ability to enact change. Women in the professional classes under the age of 45 are most likely to support the repeal movement. Soon, wealthy, urban white women emerge as its most vocal supporters. <laughs> One of these women is Pauline Morton Sabine, a New York socialite and the heiress of the Morton Salt fortune. Although she previously lacked an interest in politics, she didn't even join the women's suffrage movement, she becomes passionate about politics in 1921, when she helps found the Women's National Republican Club. She serves as its president for five years, building a membership of several thousand women and earning a reputation as a skilled political organizer and fundraiser. In 1928, Sabine watches as the dowdy WCTU president, Ella Bull, defends prohibition during a congressional hearing. When Bull proclaims, I represent the women of America, Sabine thinks to herself, Well, lady, here's one woman you don't represent. Like many women, when Prohibition first came in, Pauline Sabine was actually a supporter. I felt like I should approve of it because it would help my two sons. She said. The word pictures of the agitators carried me away. I thought a world without liquor would be 
a beautiful world. But by the late 20s, after watching how powerless the government was to stop the unregulated flow of liquor in illegal speakeasies, she officially changes her mind. The enforcement of prohibition has become a bit of a joke, and she thinks it actually encourages criminality. Children are growing up with a total lack of respect for the Constitution and for the law. The young see the law broken at home and upon the street. Can we expect them to be lawful? In 1929, Sabine forms the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform, a national bipartisan women's group dedicated to repealing the 18th Amendment. Using her political savvy, her skill in PR, and bankrolled by her millionaire husband, Pauline Sabine builds the WONPR into a formidable political group. In less than two years, 400,000 women have enrolled nationally, easily surpassing the 381,000-strong membership of the WCTU. Sabine and her friends create an image for the WONPR that feels modern, rich, and fashionable. The press love how neatly the group projects a new, smart, sophisticated iteration of the flapper. They aren't loose by any means, but they're bold and opinionated. And that is much more appealing to the woman of the later 1920s than any Ella Boole. It helps that Pauline is a force to be reckoned with, publishing articles in support of the cause, touring the country, and speaking to sold-out crowds, promising to raise an army of women so great that its backing will give courage to the most weak need and hypocritical congressman to vote as he drinks. Women will prove to them that the ballots of an aroused people are irresistible in the achievement of a fundamental project. By 1932, she's made the cover of Time magazine, and soon her organization will have the support of 1.3 million women. Meanwhile, Ella Boole and the WCTU are floundering. They attempt to attack Sabine by accusing the WONPR of only representing the views of wealthy women. Unfortunately for Ella Boole, Sabine also turns out to be a masterful debater and delights in challenging the WCTU leaders to public debates and then humiliating them. Ironically, part of Sabine's success lies in using tactics that originated with the WCTU, framing her opinions about prohibition in language associated with motherhood, so as not to be attacked for stepping too far into the male-dominated political sphere. One of her most common arguments for repeal is that, Today, in any speakeasy in the United States, you can find boys and girls in their teens drinking liquor. In this situation has become so acute that the mothers of the country feel something must be done to protect their children. On December 5, 1933, President Franklin D. Roosevelt will announce the repeal of the 18th Amendment with the ratification of the 21st Amendment. Alcohol officially becomes legal once more. And William Staten, a repeal advocate, credits women like Sabine for their work in helping to end prohibition. Anti-prohibition men had been defeatist. The women knew better. When they went to bat for the 19th Amendment, more than 13 states were against them. But they won, nevertheless. They believed from the start that they could win again. And they were right. Prohibition did cause Americans to drink less. During the first few years, alcohol consumption dropped by more than 70 percent. And although it rose slightly in the latter half of the 20s, American boozing wouldn't reach pre-World War I levels again until the 1970s. In that sense, you can say the noble experiment did work. In a lot of other senses, though, it really didn't. Prohibition led to the rise of organized crime, fostered a culture of bribery and corruption, encouraged criminality, and caused a great deal of alcohol-related poisonings and death. It also embarrassed America, as Prohibition made it clear that the U.S. government couldn't control its citizens. When the mayor of Berlin, Germany, made an official visit to New York City, he was overheard asking, When does the Prohibition law go into effect? 
Prohibition made an indelible mark on the lives of American women. Speakeasy culture made drinking a co-ed activity. Women could walk through the front door of a bar, order a drink, and not immediately be accused of being a prostitute. Progress? Speakeasies also allowed them to enjoy their independence, to drink and date in a space free of the judgmental eyes of society, or a chaperone. The demand for illicit nightlife and bootleg liquor also created more economic opportunities for women to support themselves financially. Prohibition forced men to acknowledge that women too could get drunk, engage in criminal activity, and have political opinions. Imagine that. But most importantly, Prohibition changed women's views of themselves and what they were capable of, especially in politics. It proved that women could enact political change when they were passionate about a cause. The 1920s were a decade marked by both temperance and repeal groups fiercely advocating for women to get involved in politics for the first time. And Prohibition proved that extraordinary change was possible once they understood how to wield their power. So let's raise a glass, alcoholic or not, to the women who defended and defied Prohibition. Until next time. Thanks for listening. There are lots of ways to support the Explorers. Tell a friend about the show, leave a review wherever you listen, become a patron, or send me an email telling me what you love best about the show at theexplorerspodcast at gmail.com. I always love hearing from you. You'll find show notes for this episode, images, a list of my resources, and lots more women's history at my website, theexplorerspodcast.com. Much love to Carly Quinn, my research and writing assistant, without whom this episode wouldn't have been possible. Thank you, too, to Mr. Explores, a.k.a. Paul Gablonski, for his help in editing this episode. And, of course, thanks to the following legends for their vocal stylings. Lorraine, Jessica, Crystal, Jennifer, Katie, Janae, Betsy, Cassandra, Cecilia, Goldman, Chris, and my brother John. Am I a cellar smeller? Yep, I am definitely a cellar smeller.